If you will, open your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read the last verse of chapter 4, verse 32, and then we're going to read the first 10 verses uh, of uh, Ephesians chapter 5. So we're going through it verse by verse. A lot of the uh, commentators, uh, a lot of, uh, and I, I think I agree with them, that probably uh, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 probably fits in better in chapter 4. Uh, and I believe the Word of God to be inspired, but I don't believe the paragraphs and the chapter dividings and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't think that God said stop that chapter right there. And I think the Word of God is the Word of God, but the breaks in uh, the chapter, and it really means uh, absolutely nothing if you sit down and study what's going to be said uh, after verse 2 and you study what's being said in 32, 1 and 2 of chapter 5. Uh, I seem to think that they go together better, uh, but some don't think that. But what difference does it make? Because it's all uh, the Word of God. Uh, but I do want you uh, to realize today that we're going to be talking about one key word, and that's love. Uh, and it seems like that it is harder for Christian people to love than it is for the world. And I don't understand that. Uh, I don't know whether we become prideful after we have accepted Jesus as our personal Savior. Uh, and I want to say that this church family uh, is the best church family that I've ever pastored. And I've been pastoring for 43 years. Uh, because of the things that I see done outside the church walls. I see cards being delivered. I see uh, phone calls being made. Uh, I see meals being cooked. I see different things of different areas. Uh, and that's what love is all about. Have we had any disagreements since we've been here? You bet. We've had some disagreements, but I feel like we've loved our way through those things. Uh, and love is a key uh, to the growth of this body of believers here today. Uh, and he says some really, really strong things. And uh, he talks about forgiving. And if you want to measure your love and see how deep your love for Jesus really is, uh, see how willing you are to forgive. Because when that comes, uh, and I don't care who you are, you're going to take a step back and uh, kind of walk your way through a little gingerly when you're forgiving. But that's where love comes in because if, if we were forgiven as we forgive, I'm afraid a lot of us would be in pretty bad shape. Uh, and God is so merciful to our uh, ignorance, our stupidity, our laziness, uh, just so many different things that you could think about in our own personal lives that God uh, puts up with. So we as children of God have a responsibility to forgive as he has forgiven. If you will stand in reverence to the reading of God's word, Ephesians chapter 4 starting with verse 32 and then we're going right into chapter 5 down through verse 10. He said, Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you, gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no man deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the saints of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, as we bind your presence, I ask you, Father, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit upon this body of clay. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will take this heart of mine. I pray that if there's any unconfessed sin in my heart and in my life, I pray, Father, that you'd bring those to my mind. And I pray, Father, that you would forgive me for anything that might have been said, an attitude, anything this week, God, that might have dishonored your name. I pray for forgiveness of that. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be in this uh, message today. I pray that you will speak forth your word through me. And I pray that your word will go out and accomplish your will in this congregation of people. The course that we just sang, Holy Spirit, you're welcome, and you're only as welcome as each individual allows you to be in charge of their lives today. So I ask you for total submission of our lives under the subjection of the Holy Spirit of God, under the authority of the Word of God. Send your Word, God, out to accomplish your will, whether it's conviction, encouragement, whether it's uh, to look at our lives and know that there's areas that we need to change, whatever your Holy Spirit leads us in. God, I pray that it would be accomplished in this service today. If there's one that's lost and does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and their sins are not covered by his blood through faith, I pray that this would be the time that they would accept Jesus as their personal Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we go back, and I've got a lot of verses, so I'm going to try to run quick through the verses. But I want you to notice in verse 32, he said, Be kind to one another tender-hearted, and then in that phrase, forgiving each other, and I want you to remember that phrase, forgiving each other, but there's two words here that's going to come up in verse 32, and then they're going to come up again in verse 2, and then the word as is in verse 1. So I want us to look at just as, because if you look at the word just as, if you look that up in Webster's Dictionary, you're going to find that just as means precisely the same way. So what he is saying, and I'm going to put that in there, he's saying be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other precisely just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So he said precisely the same way as God in Christ has forgiven you, I want you to forgive others. Aren't you glad that when God forgave you of your sins, all of your past sins, when you got saved, that two weeks later he didn't say, do you remember back in 1940 when you did this and I forgive you of that and you turned around and you messed up again and I'm tired of this. God didn't do that. God forgave you. God put it out there for you. And he said, I love you and I am going to forgive you through Christ. God said, you've got a relationship with me through Christ because he forgave your sin. Now I'm asking you as children of God in the church at Ephesus, this is what I need. I need a love from you guys that you can forgive each other precisely the same way that I forgave you through Christ. What did you do to deserve? I'll forgive you, but I'm gonna be watching to see if you're really gonna do what you said you were gonna do. And if you don't do what you said you were gonna do, I promise you I'll be back in your face and I'll remind you that, is that the way God forgave? No, that's not the way God forgave. We as a church family need to understand this verse, forgiving each other precisely the same way that God in Christ has forgiven us. Is that easy to do? No, it's not. Is that one of Satan's best weapons to hang around with us and to make us think that we haven't forgiven and to bring it back up and knock the scab off of the wound and let it bleed and let it get infected and let it sit there and stew and brew and all of that kind of stuff? You bet you I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. But you know what else I know? that God has enough love for me to put in me through his son Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit to accomplish what he just said. Only through him. Let's look at verse one. Therefore, he said, I've just to give you some instructions. What I need you to do is forgive, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving each other precisely the same way that I forgave you in Christ. Therefore, 
be imitators of God as beloved children. Now I want to take that imitators of God. What does imitators, if you look up the Greek, it actually just means to mimic that you're going to be exactly, and I, I looked up some things and just and just watched it with my eyes as a, you know, have you ever just sat down and traced something because I can't draw a stick horse on a piece of paper that'll even stand up. It'll fall over if I draw it on a piece of paper. I can't draw. But you know what? You can take something and I can lay it down and I can take a pencil and I'm pretty good until I got the mama shakes anyway about tracing it and I can make it look really, really close uh, to the original of somebody that actually took it and drew it out by hand and had the, the gift to be able to put it all down there on paper. I can trace that. What's he saying? He's saying mimic God. Love the way God does. You say that's impossible. That's impossible. I'm not going to tell you that you're not going to make some bumps in the road, but I want to tell you something. God himself is giving us the love through Christ uh, and the power through the Holy Spirit that we can be doing a whole lot better than what we are. The only problem is do we want to do better than what we are? Do we want to be an imitator of God? If I went to the people that you worked with last week, if I went home and sat down with your wife or I sat down with your husband and I said, what kind of life did you see out of that person last week? What kind of words did you hear out of that person's mouth? How many of them would say, my husband was an imitator of God. My coworker was an imitator of God. My wife was an imitator of God. Paul was so concerned because he spent the first three chapters saying, listen guys, Jesus has come over to the Gentile race. He's invited you in. He saved you by his blood, by his grace. You didn't deserve it. Now Paul is saying from chapter four on, walk the way that you're supposed to walk and that's in the light of Jesus Christ, We've got a mentality in this world today, Christianity, that we want, and Dustin brought this up in a Sunday night sermon just a few weeks ago. And I don't want you to get me wrong because there is a profession of faith that we need to understand, but if a profession of faith comes out of your mouth and the walk is not there, the profession is not real. Did that come out okay? If you've got a profession of mouth uh, and the walk is not there, there's something wrong with the profession that you made because if you profess Jesus Christ uh, as your Lord and Savior, uh, there's going to be a change in your heart. There's going to be a change in your talk. There's going to be a change in your walk. Your conduct of life will be different. Not maybe, it will be different. Uh, the word of God will substantiate that just as much as it will if you confess the Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart, thou shalt be saved. That's a true statement of the word of God. But when you get saved, uh, there will be a different walk in your life. It will be grounded in love. You will be an imitator of God. There will be some character. You say, oh, man, I can't believe that. Well, tell, tell Paul that. Paul said, be imitators of God. And Paul finished it up. I love that last phrase, the last three words, as beloved children. I've had people to tell me Dustin looks like me when I'm not even his biological dad. But I guarantee you, if anybody knows the fielders, you can look at Zach Fielder and know that he's a fielder, Right? You can look at me, you can know that I come from Lawrence and Clara Burton. Why is it that we can see all the physical natures, uh, but we want to walk around here and talk like the world? We want to walk like the world? We want to dress like the world? We want to watch the movies the world walk and say we're part of the family of God? Something's wrong with that picture. If you're a child of God, a beloved child of God, uh, you're going to have some resemblance of God. It's got to be there. There was a man that said this, and I want you to, I just want to read it. He said, sonship infers an absolute necessity 
of imitation. Sonship infers an absolute necessity of imitation. It, it is being in vain to assume the title of a son without the similitude of the father. Well, that's where the Christian world's at today. <laughs> we go around saying, I've got the title of a Christian. God is my father. Jesus Christ is the one that saved me, but I've got no resemblance of him whatsoever. You know why a lot of times we don't have the resemblance of him? You know how you're going to find the resemblance of God? It's not find pictures in the bookstore. It's not find pictures that Miss Elsie's put up on the wall and say, well, there it is. I, I now know how to comb my hair and I know how to be. You know the reason we don't know any more about the resemblance of God, how God acts, how God talks, how God functions? Because we never read the Bible anymore. We never sit down, this is God's instruction book. You want to know what God looks like? Study the life of Jesus. Go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read all of the red that's in that book and read it and see what kind of life that Jesus said. Look at how he treated people. Look at what he said to people. I was reading just last night where Jesus, that woman that come in that shouldn't have been in his presence at all and they got upset with him because she, she used some expensive perfume, his feet with her hair and the Jesus, they were saying, what are you doing? Jesus gave them a parable. He said, if I had somebody out here and I forgot the numbers on it now, but if I had somebody out here and I'm just paraphrasing this, but if I had somebody that owes me $10,000 and I've got somebody that owes me $5 and I say, I just cleaned the slate on both of you he said, which one of you going to love me the most? And I think it was Simon spoke up and he said, well, it would be the one that owed you the $10,000 because you forgave him a lot more. Jesus said, exactly right. This woman has been forgiven uh, and she's been forgiven of a lot and she loved me and that's the reason she did what she did. People, we need to realize that we are loved by God. He said, as beloved children. Yes, we're adopted children, but we're loved of God. Notice that he said as. And the word as, just re it refers to the function or the character of someone. As beloved children. Let's show some character of God. Let's be imitators of God. Let's go to verse 2. Here's that just as. Walk in love just as. Precisely the same way. So walk in love precisely the same way that Christ loved you. He gave himself up for you. He was an offering and a sacrifice to God for you. And he became a fragrant aroma to God for you. That's some tough stuff, ain't it? Just as Christ, in the same, precisely the same way, just like he loved you, what, how, and I, I, I taught this on Wednesday night to our, our teens. How did God love us? Did he sit up there in heaven and say, I love you? If that's all that had happened, we wouldn't be in too good a shape today, would we? We all know John 3, 16, don't we? For God so loved the world that what? I shouted a little louder till I got their attention and they know now that I love them because I said it loud enough they heard me. You know what love is? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Words are cheap. Is there anything wrong with saying I love you? I say I love you and when I say I love you, I mean I love you. But I believe that you people, and I know how I am, words can be cheap. I can say I love you all day long, but if I don't give myself up for you, that love's not very deep, is it? What would happen if we gave ourselves up 
for everyone else that is around us. So, well, they'd take advantage of me. Was that what happened to Jesus? He said, love and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice for us. Love just as. Let's go to verse 3, and we're going to read through verse 3, 4, and 5 pretty quick. He said, but immoral, immorality, any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Immorality, impurity, greed. He said, don't let this even be named among you. Why? He's going to tell us why in just a minute. But he said, get that stuff out of here. Let's go on to the next verse. He said, there must be no filthiness, silly talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of things. What would happen? Let's just start with a husband and wife. What would happen between a husband and wife if you went the next seven days and you said nothing negative to them at all but just give thanks for finding something that they did right? You reckon your husband or wife might treat you a little bit different? Things might be a little bit different come next week. Hadn't heard a sharp word. Hadn't heard anything. I mean, it's all just, man, I, I, I'm doing something right. But see, he wasn't talking about a husband and wife here. He's talking about a church family. He's talking about the church at Ephesus. So can we talk about the church at Copper Springs? And when I'm talking about the church at Copper Springs, I'm not talking about just membership. I'm talking about those of you that are here. What if we loved it? We took all the filthiness, the silly talk, the, the jesting and, and the running down and the stomping and the kicking and all of that kind of stuff of our church family and we just... Did away with that for a week. I'm just going to give thanks. I'm just going to give thanks to God. I think there'd be a big change, don't you? Let's look at the next verse. Verse 5. He said, For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man, which is an adulterer, idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You know what he's basically saying here? He's saying, guys, when you walk with Jesus, things are going to be different. Things are going to change. Don't think, don't think that you can say with a profession of faith, oh, I accepted Jesus, I accepted grace, I'm not under the law, but I still walk the same. He said, don't be that dumb. It ain't going to happen. It's not going to be in the kingdom of God. Look what he said in verse 6. This verse really gave me some problems and I'm still not sure. He said, let no one deceive you with empty words, vain words. I, when I was thinking about that, I don't know whether he's referring back to what he was just talking about, that some of the people had heard that, hey, you can accept Jesus by grace and you don't have to do the law and I can still commit adultery and I can still do this and I can still do that and, and man, everything's okay. I don't know whether there was people that were deceiving him with vain words, but there was something and all I can figure out is when he said, let no one deceive you with empty words. It needs to be the truth of the gospel uh, and you need to stand on the truth of the gospel uh, and this idolatry and all of this other stuff, this talking and all of the stuff that he just mentioned, that's not of God. Find the truth. Church, I want to tell you something. If there's ever a time you need to dig into the word of God for yourself, read it for yourself under the power of the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to help you understand the word of God, it's today. I'm telling you, there's good preachers out there that is feeding in things that are not truth. They're putting little things here and little things there and taking you away from the truth of the gospel. And if you don't know the truth, you will not see that you are being deceived by empty words. So let no man deceive you, because, deceive you with empty words for because of these things, now is these things the idolatry and all of the things that we just talked about or is it because of empty words these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 
the sons of disobedience are those that I believe that are still because he said they're sons of disobedience, they're unsaved people. You say, well, I see people every day that lives a life a lot better than I live and they don't have Jesus nowhere around. He didn't say it's going to come on them right now. He said there will be a wrath of God that's going to come upon the sons of disobedience uh, and those that reject Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel. uh, They haven't solved the wrath of God yet. And I don't care what you go through down here, you won't see the wrath of God in the way that you will when you hear him say, depart from me, I don't know who you are. When Satan's bound and cast into hell and when all of the unbelievers are in hell screaming for mercy, you'll know then that I made a mistake. But it ain't a mistake that you'll work your way through. You can file bankruptcy and in seven years you can work your way through that. You can do a lot of things. The house can burn down and in a few months, a few in a year's time you can have another place set up and be living in it and be comfortable. I want to tell you something. If you become uh, uninformed, if you become a believer in anything except the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will spend eternity in hell separated from God and there will be no return there will be no refunds Uh, you will be there throughout all eternity screaming for mercy there will be no mercy to be found let's look at the next verse verse 7 he said do not be partakers with them let's go ahead and look at verse 8 and also for you were formerly darkness but now you are light in in the Lord walk as children of light. Listen to what he just said. If you're saved here today, listen to me. He said one time you wasn't saved. You lived in darkness. But Jesus came into your life through faith and you accepted him and you asked him to come in to your heart and into your life. Now you are light in the Lord. You become from a lost person to a saved person. You became out from under the power and the domain of Satan uh, under the authority of Jesus Christ. Uh, That's what he's saying. But he didn't stop there. He said you were once in darkness. You were once lost and doomed for hell. But now you're in the light of the Lord. What did Paul finish that statement with? Walk as children of light. What did he mean? Left foot first, right foot, left foot. What did he mean? Walk. It's your conduct of life. It's your attitude. It's the words you say. It's the way you handle situations. It is everything from the time you get up of a morning till you lay your body down at night. It is everything in between. That's what he was saying is your total, complete conduct of life. Walk. Like you're a child of light. So I didn't want to hear that. I started to just share with you how many times Paul talked about walking in the light. How many times Peter talked about walking in the light. Man, it's there day after day after day and book after book after book and chapter after chapter after chapter. There's so many times Paul was so concerned. You know why he was concerned? Because he knew that people could never see God, they'd never see Jesus again because he'd already ascended and the only resemblance uh, of God was going to be coming from the church at Ephesus uh, in their conduct of life. That's the reason Paul spent that time. You know how a guy Arkansas is going to recognize God and see a resemblance of God walking around in guy Arkansas? It's not going to be because God came down through the skies and through a cloud and sat down out here on the parking lot and jumped up off the cloud. It's not going to be any of that. You know how he's going to find a resemblance? You know how guy Arkansas is going to find a resemblance? It'll be in me and you and our conduct of life. And if that don't reflect it, it won't be reflected. Let's look at verse 9. For the fruit of the light consists in goodness and righteousness and truth. I'm really concerned. I'm really, really concerned. I very seldom talk to anyone that says I'm lost 
and I'm going to hell. And I know that because I've rejected Jesus Christ. Most people will stand and say, well, I remember I had a confession of faith. And I remember at a vacation Bible school. Or I remember this and I remember that. And no, I hadn't been to church in 35 years. And no, I hadn't done anything. I hadn't picked up my Bible. And no, I, I, I don't do the things that God wants me to do. And I know that I'm an embarrassment to the kingdom of God. But I believe when I die, I'll go to heaven. Really? You know what the Bible says? I believe it's the book of Proverbs. I may be wrong on this. But God said in his word that you can believe a lie and be damned. You can sit here and believe you're okay and be damned and go to hell. You can sit here and, con and convince yourself, I'm okay. I want to tell you, if you're okay, there will be some fruit of the light. It will be there. And it will consist, according to the, God, the word of God, in goodness, righteousness, and truth. And not your goodness, not your righteousness, not your truth, but the truth of God in his son Jesus Christ is the goodness, the righteousness, and the truth. Uh, and if you reject that, I can tell you now, you will spend eternity in hell. And if you accept it, there will be fruit of the light. If there is not fruit of the light, there is not salvation of Jesus Christ. You say, well, can a man backslide? Yes, he sure can. But if he's content in that backslidden condition, I'm a firm believer and this is a Gary Burden. I can't take you to a book, chapter, and verse, okay? But I believe the most miserable human being on the face of this earth is a backslidden Christian because I believe God is spanking his backside every day that he wakes up. And if you're sitting and you're okay with your backslidden condition and you're okay and you're not going to do anything any different and you say, I, I don't have any guilty conscience about it, I don't think you got any of the fruit of the light in you. Let's look at the last verse. This is a verse that I want to close with. Trying to learn. I want to ask you, are you trying to learn? What are we trying to learn? What's pleasing to the Lord? How do I do that? Well, church attendance would be one thing. Bible study on Wednesday night would be another good thing. Every day, picking up your Bible and reading God's Word would be a good thing. But here's the key, trying to learn. See, Dustin... Back, I think it was in the fifth, sixth grade, somewhere along in there. He was on a basketball team. And he was not much of a shooter, but he was a rebounding machine. If there was a ball went on the backboard, most of the time at his age, he was taking it down. But he had one weakness. When it comes to shooting free shots, he was probably at about 5%. So, you know, at close to the end of the game, if the other team was ahead, I think he was number 32. I'd have to look back and see. But you'd hear the coach of the opposing team say, when 32 rebounds, foul him. That's what they did. He'd go, miss the shot. They'd go down and score. We lost a lot of games that way. But Dustin and I sat down and said, are we going to try to learn something from this and, and change this? You know what we did? We come up with a plan and we got a key to the old gym at Southside School. And the year, the, after that year before we started playing basketball, about two weeks before we started playing basketball, we went up to the gym and Dustin stood on the free shot line and I was a rebounded man. We shot 200 free shots every day for 14 days. The 10% went to about 90 plus percent because he stood there and shot and shot and shot, trying to learn that when I'm put in that position, trying to learn 
that I can do better than this. You know what? Didn't take but about two games. Foul number 32. No, that was a mistake. Both of them went in. Foul number 32. And then you'd hear say, leave number 32 alone. He had learned to nail some free shots. But when we were trying to learn, do you think this fat old man had fun chasing them balls all across the court to get it back to him to shoot? Do you think this old man enjoyed driving to Southside School every afternoon and sat there for an hour and a half, two hours, according to where the balls went and how tired I got? It took a while. Do you think Dustin enjoyed shutting the Xbox down and going up there to shoot that 200 every day? No, he didn't enjoy it. He'd rather been on the Xbox. He'd rather been doing things that he enjoyed doing. But did it make a difference? Yes, it did. I said all of that to say, if you don't put forth the effort to try to learn what's pleasing to the Lord, your life will come back next week just like it left this week. If he hadn't went to the gym, he'd have went back missing shots just like he did before he went. And if we don't make an effort to try to learn what is the pleasing to the Lord. If the effort's not there, guess what? You won't be pleasing God. You say, well, I'm not. I'm content with it. I'm okay with it. I'd say check your salvation if that's the way you feel today. Because I'm saying to you, pleasing the Lord when this life is over is all that's going to matter. Ain't going to matter what kind of house you lived in, what kind of vehicle you drove, which seats you sat on, how many times you attended, what's going to be pleasing to the Lord is loving one another.